historical, the historical club meeting of the year. So glad you could all be here. Before we get started with everything, let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. The flag is back behind us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a couple of housekeeping items before we get started with our presentation. First off, I'd like to remind everybody to please silence your telephones. That's a biggie. Um, we have a new projector. Yes, we are, we are just getting into the modern age here. We have a new projector thanks to Steve McMahon. There is also an extension cord running down the middle. So if you get up, please be extremely careful. And please, don't fall over the extension cord. We don't want to lose any of you. We'll have to buy a new projector. <laughs> We have, uh, we have a really good bank balance, $1,876.83 uh, as of right now. Mary Crigo is collecting dues, our $10 dues, so if you haven't paid your dues, please see Mary before you leave, or send in the little slip that you received in the mail with your dues. Most important, uh, let's see, uh, water bottles. When you are done with your water bottle, you can put it over here in the cover. We'll take the back of recycling. <coughs> See what else? Extension cord. I think I carved this off because we have such a good speaker tonight. I'm coming to it. I'm not ready to. Our speaker tonight is Susan P. Gately. She is. Oh my goodness gracious! She is a prolific writer and accomplished in so many different things. So many different things. She brought some of her books with her, with her tonight that you can purchase and she will sign them for you. Uh, she has a fabulous website, SusanPGately.com. It's really, really good. I enjoyed it. There's a video on there and all kinds of information. So uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce Susan P. Gately, our guest speaker for tonight. She is going to speak about the canal system. Yay! <laughs> this my computer keeps saying my battery is dying but it's only a 15 minute program <laughs> I thought that after I did the program I would do a short reading from an earlier book I did about the canal so I'll talk about that a little bit more but without further ado while we still got a battery let's uh, go full speed ahead on the canal I'm going to use the script because I haven't got this memorized so pardon me for reading it but last year, I decided that it was time for a new book about the contemporary canal. It's been about 30 years since the last uh, general history of the canal system was published. And that is called The Long Haul. It's out of print, but you can still buy used copies. I highly recommend it. It's a good book. But I thought that a new perspective was in order. So History Press put this out in uh, June. Now, let's see if we can get to the next slide. Um, this is Oswego Harbor, and this is where we began our canal trip in 2023. Uh, there's really nothing like the canal, and I don't think I'm telling you people something you don't already know, that it is unique in, in really in North America. It stitches together towns and cities, historic sites, and natural areas of great beauty. The Oswego River is part of the system, and it is also the canal and the Finger Lakes and the Oswego River are the largest watershed in the Lake Ontario Basin. The canal at one point, and actually still today, ties the Great Lakes from Duluth all the way down to Saltwater in New York City. So that was once a huge commercial um, artery and there's been many many books written about the early days of the canal. Um, this is a sort of a profile that shows a little bit of how the canal draws on water from as far north as the Adirondacks and as far south as the Susquehanna drainage. 
Its biological influences are potentially very, very large as a potential corridor for unwanted invasive species. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how that might have effects on the navigation of the canal. This is a Howland Island um, photo from the, this spring when we were anchored behind it. The canal system uh, has some very remote, uh, beautiful, unspoiled areas like the marshes of Montezuma and some of the areas along the Clyde and Seneca River are just, just absolutely gorgeous, you know, I just, ugh, gorgeous big trees and forests and really, really remote. When we were at that last location, anchored that evening, we're pretty sure we heard a bobcat calling. <laughs> um, this is a lock at Oswego, the first lock at Oswego. Today's canal, I said in my book, is really a linear museum of analog engineering. It was completed more or less pretty much totally in 1914. They phased in the various sections. And it is the oldest continuously used uh, transportation corridor in the US, according to the National Heritage Site. And this is the opening of the Erie Canal, about which a lot has been written. But I'm skipping ahead to today's canal. And this is the knitting mill there that's now turning into part of the uh, Women's Museum. And the tug in the foreground is the Syracuse. That's kind of an interesting tug because it was designed as an icebreaker back in the, back in the 30s and 40s. So it's, it's a vintage, it's a, a vintage boat in its own right and it's still very much active and part of the working fleet. Um, historians say that it's no coincidence that the Canal Corridor was a hotbed of abolitionist activity, religious fervor, and the women's rights movement, and also the home to help spark one of today's great churches, the Latter-day Saints. It germinated in Palmyra, which was a canal town. So the canal was a wealth builder. It was perhaps equal to the stock exchanges of the world at the height of a roaring bull market. Seneca Falls builds itself as the one-time pump capital of the world. And a whole string of manufacturing endeavors sprang up along the canal in the early 19th century version. The knitting mill here supplied socks for the Union troops during the Civil War. An estimated 3,000 workers, mostly women, finished the factory knitted socks at their homes back then. Also, at the little museum in Seneca Falls, I noted a display that stated the Seneca Knitting Mill Socks were the first socks to land on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> the Apollo asteroid has worn Seneca Mill Socks. Uh, this is an aqueduct from the earlier version of the canal, right down in Camillus, which I look at your map and I see you're not very far from here. And I assume many of you have been to the Camillus Canal Museum. If you have a by all means, this is pretty rare. I, I'm not sure if there's any other functional aqueduct like this that has a boat ride that goes across it. And they do do that. So they all volunteer restore it. Pretty impressive. But we weren't really supposed to be talking too much about this. So let me just say that the first canal was built mainly, uh, well, for several reasons, but one reason for building the original Erie Canal was they wanted an alternative route to Lake Ontario for shipping. At the time after the 1812 war, memories were still pretty fresh that there was a hostile nation on the other side of Lake Ontario. And they weren't so sure they really wanted to ship their goods on, on the lake if there was an alternate route. And so that was part of the impetus for building the, the original canal. Uh, this is a picture of the dam up, I think this is the high dam up at Oswego. And it still, the Oswego Canal and the rest of the system does carry some commercial traffic, but not very much. 
But one of the things it does do is hydro. It's a hydropower source. And this particular dam is associated with a fairly husky, fairly hefty uh, hydropower station. Um, and I write about that a little bit in the book. The heart of the canal is the lock system. Nearly all of the locks on the canal are what they call a miter gate lock. It's an old but reliable design, and it was said to have been invented by Leonardo da Vinci. On the river sections of the canal, the locks are almost always paired with a dam. Um, this, I believe, is the Seneca Falls of a lock, lock number two um, at Seneca Falls. And this is just another, this is the beginning of what they call Waterford Flight, uh, the first lock that you enter. This climbs from sea level almost, I think you're eight feet above sea level, to uh, like 160 feet above sea level. And it's still one of the largest lifts uh, anywhere. This is a, a shot of, uh, of a dam that is associated with the lock that goes into Cayuga Lake. Pretty much they always, the lock tender also has to look after a dam on these junctions. And this is a close up, this is what they call a Tanter Gate Dam. And it's a little tricky the way it works, and it's kind of hard to picture it, but it's kind of, it's pretty ingenious. It's sort of curved, and the, the whole thing is, is uh, under compression, as it were, by the water, but yet it's easy to lift it. So I attempt to explain it in the book, and I'm not even going to try now. <laughs> this is uh, one more lock. This is lock 17, the biggest single lift on the canal, and it's at Little Falls. It was finished up around 1916. And you can't help but think about it, that this is 100-year-old machinery as you go under that gate. This counterweight here, this big gray thing up there, you can see some little blocks, on, little tiny blocks that are trimming weights to make it even out. That's 150 ton, that counterweight. And you have to go under it <laughs> with your old boat. You think, well, it's 100 years old. Hopefully, it's all still going to hold together. Now, we have successfully squeaked under the gate that dripped on us, and we are now departing. And this is the view that you would see if you were going to enter Lock 17 and go up. And note the red light, if any of you are canalers, you're familiar with the traffic light system that they have. You can see in there a leak between the, uh, the seal there. They almost all have at least a small leak. It's just a, this is kind of the view when you're down in the dank, slimy chamber. <laughs> and I will say this, that the lock operators, if, you're, if any of you are not voters, um, you might not know that these people are extremely skilled and very dedicated. They're, they are, um, without exception in my experience, really, really look after the voters. They know how to open the valves and close the valves in such a way as to generate a minimal amount of turbulence. Um, they're um, really key people to the operation of the canal. They know how to keep things going smoothly, and there once in a while they do have a mishap. And I probably, I'm sure I've gone through at least 100 different times I've gone through locks. I've never seen any kind of problem at all. But I have heard a few stories. <laughs> and in Oswego, there was a guy that had uh, one of the lock tenders in Oswego had at his station where he opened, he had the buttons he pushes and levers to open and shut the valves and the gates. He had a, a, a very sharp, shiny hatchet right there. And I knew right away what it was for because sometimes people get hung up with their lines and they get, once the boat is sinking and it gets too much tension, they can't undo it. So they're going to get, he cannot just stop the water. And he doesn't just shut one bell. Once the water starts going up or down, it's going to keep going up and down for at least five minutes before he can, before he can stabilize it. So 
So that was to chop the bolts lines if need be. <laughs> I also heard a story about a guy who, he was fishing with his dog and the dog fell into the lock. And the lock tender went down and pulled the dog out and he's going up this ladder as the lock is filling, trying to stay ahead of the water. And he managed to get himself and the dog out safely ahead of the water. One of the, uh, to me, one of the most striking aspects of the canal is these embankments. They're like an overpass. Picture the canal in this picture is going over Oak Orchard Creek. And below, where you, kind of where the turn starts, there is a gorge that's at least 30 feet deep with a 30 foot waterfall below the canal. You can see the water of the canal over there to the right, the smooth, calm water. And Oak Orchard Creek is way down there. I probably should put a picture of the waterfall in there. It's hard to visualize it. This is another old picture of an embankment from the previous version of the canal. This is before they canalized the Mohawk River. But you can see that how it goes over the, the over over there, it's going over the canal. It's another aqueduct. And there's a great big long one that goes across Aronaqua Creek, which is, this is, this is, this one is still in place. And it, the only thing that's different is there's a lot more trees. And when you get further along to the west, there's a lot more houses. But this is the um, Aronaqua embankment. And this one's pretty famous because it's, not too terribly long ago at Bushnell's Basin, they had a whoops and all the water came out through a hole in the bottom. <laughs> and it took, it took several houses out. Um, and I write about it in the book, but basically they were digging a sewer line and they broke into the bottom of the canal and put it under the canal. But this is so bizarre when you go on a boat through here and you're looking down on the roofs of the houses. It's very, very odd. And what, what an amazing engineering feat, I think. It, it, it just kind of boggles the mind. Um, OK, um, and I write quite a bit about these engineering uh, feats, because I think the uh, current canal is every bit as impressive in its own way as the old uh, 19th century one. So this spring, uh, we decided that we would go canaling. This is a 23-foot trailerable sailboat that we bought in 2017. She's small enough that we can raise and lower the mast by ourselves. We don't need a crane or anything to do it. And we did a canal trip with her in 2018. She had an outboard motor, and it was noisy and smelly, and we had to find gas for it. So for various reasons, um, my hubby decided to electrify the boat and put an electric motor in it. So uh, that turned out to be really well suited to the canal because you could go along real quiet and just hear the birds singing and you could talk to the walkers on the towpath. And so this is just a shot of the electric uh, German-made torpedo. Uh, it's it's a, what they call a pod that bolts onto the bottom of the boat. And so that we were very, very happy with. So then we ran into a guy named David Borton. I don't know if any of you guys have heard of him or not. He's, he was in Oswego with a boat that was solar powered and was charging up every day with sunlight. Well, what do you think the hubby wanted to do after he saw that? <laughs> he says, oh, that is too cool. So this spring, he, he purchased 1,500 watts worth of panels, created this bolt-on canopy that can, can be I won't say it's easily lifted up the pole, but it's, you had to build a crane to do it. Uh, but this, uh, there's, there it is getting it put in place. You can see the chain hoist. It weighs about 500 pounds. But the end result of this was that we were able to operate at about four and a half, not, roughly five miles an hour, which is what we did with the outboard. And we were able to most days, we were able to start with 100% charge on the battery in the month of June, when the days are long, and we ended almost every day except twice. 
in a two-week trip with 100% charge at night. And how we did it was during the day, we had an excess. We, we were able to maintain about a four knot, five mile an hour speed with an excess of power going into the batteries. Then we would draw on the batteries. After about two, three o'clock in the afternoon, we'd start drawing on the battery. And in the morning, we would draw on the battery. We'd tie up somewhere. And you know, the sun doesn't go down until like 8, 30, 9 o'clock in June. So by the time we were done with dinner, we were usually charged back up to 100%. And we went uh, 280 miles without ever plugging in. We were, we were pretty happy with that. And since we did that, uh, I have heard of at least uh, four different uh, people doing the same thing. These DIY people. Are, the canal is very well suited to it. It's, it's ideal for it. Uh, here's a shot of, there we are in Phoenix among all the big monster diesel powered things. And uh, the, the blue tarp is to keep yeah, the sun out of the cockpit because it was a really hot night. It was glaring in there. But the, once again, the canal, I cannot uh, stress how, well, I'll read, I'll read a little bit about what it's like to be on the canal because it's uh, definitely got an appeal. And these boats, a lot of these big boats are locals that have gone to Phoenix for the monthly fireworks display, but we ran into a number of people doing what they call the loop. And typically, the boat behind our little sailboat would be what they would do the loop in. And the loop was they would go up the east coast, through the canal, up into like the upper Great Lakes, and then down the Mississippi to the Gulf, sometimes by way of the Tennessee Tom Bigby Waterway. And it's apparently very popular among these retired people. This is the boat that inspired uh, my hubby. Solar Cell was built by a retired uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic uh, professor who had worked with solar energy for years and years. And he, with the help of a bunch of school kids, they built this boat to his design in a, in a bus garage. <laughs> he put in a battery bank, he put in the panels, and he traveled with the boat to Buffalo, picked up five tons of cardboard, and traveled back to a location, a mill on the, the Champlain Canal that recycled the cardboard. And he designed it with enough solar input so that he could operate 24-7. He could go all night with his battery bank. We didn't have that big a battery bank, but his idea was to prove that this was, you know, real work could be done this way. And, and it's happening. It, a number of people, I know we talked to one a lot time for quite a while because he saw what we were doing, but you know, our little sailboat people were like, hey man, I'm doing that. That is so too cool. <laughs> so uh, this is just a shot of the canopy. That's the 1500 watt panels. And what we did after we were done with the, with the canal trip is we took them off and they're now angled in the backyard and we're plugging a Chevy Bolt in getting a few miles out of it from, with the Chevy Colt. It's in, in, the, in the summer we were getting about, oh, I bet you we were getting 12, 15 miles a day in the summer, but now it's more like 8 to 10 miles. So we're not going to be getting a lot this winter. We're going to be plugging the car and getting ready again. Um, I put this uh, photo of the urger in as a concluding photo because there was some talk a while ago about the uh, power authority that now operates the canal doing some experimental electrification of their work boats. And we just think that the urger, who was a goodwill ambassador for the canal for 20 years, would be a wonderful candidate for it because she was originally steam powered, then they put an old Atlas diesel in her. But if they could leave the diesel in place, put, put batteries and, and small compact electric motor in her, she would really be a, a great example of how old can be adapted to new. And we'll end with a nice picture of the peaceful canal. This is the Seneca River, not very far from here, actually. It's a little bit to the west. 
And this one is the Oswego River. And you can sure see the appeal for uh, people who like flat water. <laughs> You're not going to sail on it, but it's a really peaceful place in a lot of areas. We have gotten quite a book on it, and we're planning to do the Rideau next year. That's the one up in Canada that goes between Kingston and Ottawa. So I thought that what I could do for a few minutes, if we get the lights back on, is uh, do a reading with a little bit of an idea of just what the canal is like. So um, but before I do that, does anybody have any questions or comments or doesn't understand what we did or yeah, anything at all about the current canal? And there's plenty of information about it in the book. So, yes? When you mentioned it was the longest continuum of the operating transportation system, that was the Erie and now the Marsh Canal? Yeah, I, you know, it's a little iffy about how you define transportation corridor. I mean, heck, the bridge road was being used by the Indians for hundreds of years. But I think they were talking about, like, in the industrial age, and in the Erie, the second Erie, the third one that we've got now. I think that's how they... And when you think about it, the transportation corridor also includes, um, when you're, you're going through the Mohawk Valley, there's a pinch point there, and you've got the railroads, you've got the throughway, and you've got the canal all running through that pinch point, which is what made it all happen. It's one of the very few gaps in the, in the Appalachian mountain chain. And basically, they don't call them the Appalachians, but they go all the way up into Maine. And they don't, you wouldn't think these little bitty molehills, if you're from Colorado, would stop people, but they really were a barrier for a number of decades to settlement. And the canal is just, uh, it was just a natural to adapt that, that, that uh, big mobile canal. And I got a little bit about the geology that because it's related to Lake Ontario in the Ice Age. When the glacier receded, um, the huge gush of water went down through there. So the Mohawk Valley is way bigger than what the Mohawk River would suggest it should be because it's releasing for hundreds of years, releasing all of this water from the prehistoric uh, Great Lakes collectively. So anyway, let me go to page 55. This particular book I did about 20 years ago now. I still have a couple hundred copies left. <laughs> <laughs> passages on Inland Waters, I ran off 1,500. So, still got some left. Uh, passages on inland waters, mostly on Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River, but I, we, we did do a canal trip in uh, 1999, and it was my first trip on the canal, so I'm going to read a little bit about it, because I guess you folks are history people. So, uh, the canal. Susan, do you want to use the microphone? Ah, get over here. I'll just pick it up. Yeah, let's see. Hopefully that's going to work. The canal nourished a corridor of industrial development and innovation that made this truly the Empire State, for a time the most populous and powerful in the nation, and the only state to ever undertake and maintain a public works waterway of such magnitude. The list of inventions and leading technology developed by a single canal site company alone, the Remington Rand Corporation, based in Ilium, is staggering. The first production run of Velocipedes, that's the early, early bicycle. Broom and match making machinery, bank vaults, office furniture, office machines to house them, sewing machines, and of course typewriters all came forth from its factories. Founded in 1816 by a blacksmith farmer, the company remains in business today making firearms. The company may well outlive this canal too, who knows, but by its um, Unlike its earlier line cut versions, the current canal was created by an intricate process of controlling water levels of various rivers across the state. This was a major engineering undertaking. They simply couldn't have done that before we had electricity. It just wouldn't have been possible because it would have been able to open the, the big locked doors. 
Um, this major undertaking involved hundreds of culverts, dams, tantric gates, locks, guard gates, and other water control structures. A lock tender told me that his lock machinery was a scaled down version of the Panama Canal's machinery, and some of the electrical relays that the locks used were actually leftovers from the contractor's Panama job. The Panama locks were constructed a few years before the Erie's last enlargement, which basically opened in 1914. Nearly a century later, despite its complexity and the restless shifting forces of nature it must deal with, the waterway continues to work, for the most part, pretty smoothly. When you enter your first lock and hear the groan of the doors closing behind you, and you look at that white jet of water spurting along the sill of the upstream doors as tons of river press against the steel looming overhead, ready to burst in and drown you in an instant. Your regard for the work of those now forgotten artisans and early 20th century engineers rises with the water beneath your keel. Locking through was generally pretty painless, so the first time was interesting. We approached slowly, waiting for the traffic light by the gates to turn green. We then glided into the dank depths. A certain sense of fatalism was in order as the massive steel gates closed astern with a low thud that echoed off the surrounding slime-covered cement walls. Our lives were now at the mercy of 95-year-old machinery designed by long-dead civil engineers. Then the sudden boil, 20 feet across, erupted behind the boat, and the water began to rise, lifting Titania and her crew with surprising, nearly silent speed into the sunlight. It was good to see the geraniums in the lockside flower beds and feel the sun's warmth as the water leveled out and grew still again, and the gates swung open to release us. It is a very interesting uh, experience, and uh, I highly recommend it. And just a little bit more about the contemporary canal. Um, ah, okay, my traveler's log records after leaving Little Falls, that was where the big block 17 was. This was a day of the winding Mohawk River, a vivid blue sky, bright green farm fields, and of turkey buzzards soaring on the updrafts off hillsides. Near Fonda, the hills pressing close, and rail, canal, and highway squeezed together within a few hundred yards of each other. At one point, they all curve around a looming steep gray rock slope some 600 feet above. I'm steering to Tanya while a few feet above me to starboard, trucks and cars stream by. As we swing around the rock outcrop, it feels like I'm driving a boat at six miles an hour down the shoulder of the throughway. <laughs> I can even read the signs, Albany, 42 miles, New York City, 190. As Titania chugged through the Mohawk Valley, and this hasn't changed, this was written 20 years ago, she passed several large abandoned brick and stone factory buildings by the river. They stood silent with broken or boarded up windows reflected in calm waters, reminders of an earlier time of a younger, more vibrant 20th century smokestack economy, a time when technology was analog and the Rust Belt lay far in New York's future. Further on, the canal passed through part of the old city of Schenectady, allowing me to peer up the quiet residential side streets at the brick houses and to exchange waves with the dog walkers. Here, while I was at the tiller, gazing down the side streets, I saw a dark-haired young woman alone on a bench behind the canal. We looked directly at each other, and I felt a thought as if she had spoken to me. Where are you going with that boat? I want to come too. <laughs> <laughs> and that is something that you get when you're on the canal, because you're so visible. People can see you traveling. It's, you know, these days, most traveling is you get on an airplane, or get on a train, and, you know, you flash by somebody on the train, but on the canal, they just, you know, six miles an hour, and they have plenty of time to see you and wonder about you. Where are they? Where are they going? Where have they been? So it's, it's, it's great. It's great. It's great. It's great. It's a lot of fun, and you don't have to be a very skilled boat operator either. Not at all. There are several companies that charter boats, and we did one last fall 
um, where you can go overnight for, you can get a three, five, or six day charter, and, you get, and they give you a very brief how to run the boat. They're, they're designed for the canal, and uh, they're very easy to operate, except when it's windy. If it's windy, then they can be a little bit of a challenge. Uh, but they're made out of steel, so if you bang them around in the locks, you're going to hurt them. <laughs> and uh, we did that. We took a 38-foot one for, for a six-day trip. <coughs> and it was, it was a lot of fun. Was, you split it up. You know, say you've got enough beds in them, you can split it up and keep the cost down. And it's, I highly recommend it. It's, it's great fun. And you just have to be able to reach out and grab a rope and kind of hold it. But it's not very physical. It's a, it's, a good place for old people. <laughs> and the older we get, the more we like it. <laughs> so I'm about finished up. If anybody's got a comment or wants to elaborate, yes, sir. So one thing I've heard, you know, there's chronic flooding on the Barge Canal, yeah. the Seneca River, west yeah. of, from Baldwinsville west to basically the Finger Lakes, yeah. especially from Cross Lake. And I've heard someone told me once that when the canal was originally designed, there was supposed to be an overflow ditch dug between the Seneca River to Ox Creek, so that it would bypass Baldwinsville and Onondaga Lake. Yeah. I didn't know if you did your research. You heard I that. did not run into that, but I, I have, uh, I did read a little bit of the the, the flooding and the, the you know the, the water control issues. And I said I was going to mention something about biological invasive species in the canal. There, there has been talk about shutting down part or all of the current canal system to keep invasive species out of Lake Champlain and also from spreading through the canal system. There's been some talk about that. And a, a, a retired lock tender told me, you really couldn't do that. We couldn't totally shut the canal down because it is such, it is tied in so intimately with the hydrology of this whole region. He says basically you drop the water level when you built the new canal to the Seneca River, you drop the water level in Montezuma Marsh six feet. So you gotta maintain that because people building houses on where that used to be, you know, used to be a marsh. So I think this flooding thing is not going to go away because there's more and more building, more and more waterfront real estate. In 20 years, we can see a lot more. Uh, used to be these little shanties. Now they're putting big gear around the houses up. And they're on floodplains. And we're going to have more extreme weather events. So it's going to be a challenge for the people running the canal. And I'm not quite sure how it's all going to work out. But they're going to have to keep it going in some form or other. Whether it'll be for navigation on boats or not, I don't know. But it's so tied in with with the rest of the with the rivers and the natural bodies of water that I don't think they can abandon it. Gonna be a trick if they do. So uh, let's see. And I don't have any answer on that one. Yes. And um, what does a sailor do in the winter time? Meaning you. Oh, right about it. <laughs> You're right about sailing. <laughs> right about it and read about it. Okay. Uh, you don't put on no any. You know, that, that, that one on. trip that we made, we actually did take the boat down to salt water uh, and spent some time on salt water with her. We didn't spend the whole winter on her, but that was the only time we ever did that. So, no, we just, we're just uh, icebound like everybody else. But you do see every fall quite a few boats from Michigan and Toronto and other places, the so-called snowbirds using the system to go down to go down to Florida. <laughs> yeah, believe me, I wanted to. <laughs> I thought that would be a great thing to do. How about uh, in January, let's say, going through the system? What kind of shipping is going through? I mean, the big container ships, they... They, uh, okay, both the sailors... The the no, they don't. Course course not. The, the canal is... Uh, geez, what is it, 300 feet, I think, on the length of the locks. Um, the canal shuts down now, it shuts down in October. They shorten the season and uh, opens up. It used to go basically April through um, early November, but 
they've been nibbling away at the season from both ends to save money, I guess. Um, so there's the, any commercial traffic that's on there is just like tons and barges. Um, they are going to be not able to operate much after October um, until April, May. Um, so, and the St. Lawrence shuts down. In yeah. the, the one that does have the big ships on it, it goes down to Montreal. And that shuts down usually in December, sometime in mm -hmm. December. Gets going again in early, early April. So, so that is one of the things that kind of killed the canal commerce because of course the railroads could go year round. But that, but it is interesting that the the new version, the, the 1914 version, was almost not built because it was already becoming kind of obsolete because of that seasonality. But the reason they decided they wanted it, the state wanted it, was they did not want to be um, uh, at the mercy of the railroads. The railroads would have a monopoly on cargo. And so they really wanted to keep a check on the railroad rates by having the canals competition. And that, that is the reason why they did go ahead and float the big bond issue and modernized it and enlarged it. And they didn't get very much federal help for it. Just a little bit during the Depression. But the most part has been strictly a New York State endeavor. Kind of unusual that way. Yes? Uh, you showed a picture of the Urger, which was originally an icebreaker? The Urger was originally a fish tub on Lake Michigan. And yes, I think maybe she was designed to operate in ice on Lake Michigan. And she operated as a fish tug, a coal, a steam-powered fish tug, I think for about 10 or 15 years. And then she was converted into a tug on the upper lakes. And in 1914, they, they bought her, brought her down to operate on the New York system. So yeah, I think she was designed to handle ice. The Syracuse was specifically built as an icebreaker tug. Oh, okay. and, and they used her. There's, the long haul book that I mentioned has a great photo of, of these um, boats that were caught by an early freeze on Oneida Lake. And it was back in the 30s after the Syracuse had been built. And they showed this picture of she's broken up. It was like one foot, 12 inches thick ice on Oneida Lake in November. And she's broken a trail and they're all following her across Oneida Lake because some of them were caught for five days. Icebound because they didn't have they were old wooden barges and they couldn't pull those things through the ice. So um, not so much a problem now because they're shut the canal down so early. Mm -hmm. You know they don't really have to worry. I, they do worry about ice on the Mohawk River and they do do some ice breaking there um, because those you'll read about the movable dams in my book and those. Um, those are prone to damage from ice, so they do do um, ice, these, these big jam ups, so called ice dams, these big jam ups of ice on the river. Uh, they do actually do some ice breaking, the power authority does do some, uh, but they, they use some specialized, smaller boats to do it. Yeah. I just, you brought back so many memories for me. Thank you for that. I, ah. I didn't forget, but I made that trip from Oneida all the way down to um, so the far. flight. No, to the flight to the Hudson and up north to Champlain. I oh, well, to Luke Champlain? Yeah, I made that trip a couple times. And it was funny when you showed the picture of the slimy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I wouldn't remember. Yeah. It was coming back after Labor Day. And it wasn't like this. It was freezing cold. It was raining. And going through all those locks, those icy colds. Slimy And you forgot your gloves. Yes. You yeah. had your gloves. You woke up by the end of the season, they got real slimy. Sometimes they got zebra mussels all over them. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The one thing I noticed not too long into my canaling career was, um, in, at least I remember this in the Oswego River. Uh, as you're going down past Sulla Slime, people go like, so and so lost so and so. <laughs> <laughs> Some was here, you know, maybe the boat. So 
so I would put the tongue on his hair and <laughs> write, write it with your finger in his spine. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing you might want, I guess. <laughs> uh, yes, it's pretty deep. It's pretty deep. Yeah, that, it's, it was an awful lot of fun, but now we're kind of curious to go try Canada and see what the Rito is like. And um, maybe you can do a little bit of the Trent Sever and, and you know, do the solar power thing on the canals again. But the salt water was, it was special when we got down there to the tide. That was pretty exciting. <laughs> I bet you remember that. Well, I lived in Florida for many years. <laughs> so, yeah, but when you go from the canal, go from the canal and get into the Hudson. In the Hudson, yeah. It was, yeah. It was like a big deal. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. I even remember it. It just brought back these crazy memories um, as we were, we were on the Hudson. And the person I was with, his parents lived right, like, right in the house, right on the Hudson, and he had the dog with us. And he's like, oh, I'm going to let the dog go and hang out with my parents while we travel up the street. Goes over to their house, and off we go. <laughs> up the Hudson. We right. have not gotten up the Champlain Canal without a boat. We sailed, we trailered her over and sailed on Lake Champlain, and we went a little ways down the mass up, but. You know, we didn't get into the canal system. We didn't take the mask down and do that. And I understand it's super uh, scenic. The first 30, 40 miles, apparently, it's really scenic. And I kind of like to do that sometime. Maybe trailer her over and dump her in the water and do it. Coldest water in, a, in you know, July, August, icy, cold, Lake Champlain, just mm -hmm. freezing cold water. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, it's a pretty fascinating system. Any more questions? So this was great. This was really great. Um, November 8th, oh, it's 
Steve McMahon, a mysterious true crime from Baldwinsville's distant past. Oh, I know. Everybody thought Baldwinsville was squeaky clean. <laughs> librarian of the Onondaga County Public Library System, and also Bonnie's daughter. And, well, this is going to be so good. I'm really looking forward to this. March 5th, we have History of the Baldwinsville Volunteer Fire Department, Tom and Roxanne Perkins, who together have almost 100 years of service with the Baldwinsville Fire Department. I think that's awesome, considering they're so young. And May 7th, the Erie Canal, past, present, future, that's Dan Wiles. Oh, He's going cool. to speak to us about He will be terrific if you haven't heard him before. No. He is Mr. Canal. He's <laughs> so good. I, I went on the Canal Society uh, tour last spring, and he was on the bus helping with the, he is, well, his family was Midlake's Navigation. Oh. So he basically oh, okay. grew up on the Canal. Oh, okay. He's fantastic. You are really going to enjoy him. Right. Well, we really enjoyed you. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Now, I just want to remind everyone, you have to take a cookie home and those little pumpkin things. I know. I got more napkins if you need more napkins. So, Susan, thank you again. And thank you. Two of her books, and they're both wonderful. So I highly encourage you to pick up a book.